Dr. Patrick, I've heard some people say that the vaccines themselves might be contributing to putting certain pressures on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, specifically this idea that the vaccines can make the virus actually more deadly or more virulent. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I certainly like coming into to hearing these statements, which I've, I've heard and it's proliferated on, on many different areas of the blogosphere and people that I, that I, you know, friends of friends, you know, et cetera. Um, my first thought was, well, if this is, tr we need to know whether or not this is true, because if it is, it's changes everything in a way, right? You don't want to make a vaccine, you don't want to make um, a virus, you know, more deadly to the unvaccinated. And that's kind of what the the, the general statement is, is that, that vaccines are causing selective pressure for the virus to mutate into a more virulent form, which is more dangerous and deadly to the unvaccinated. Nobody wants that. Like, like if that were the case, I mean, all of our children are unvaccinated. So, you know, as a parent, to me, I wanted to get to the bottom of this and understand, is this something to be concerned about? Because if it is, it's a game changer in my mind. So um, as a non-evolutionary biologist, I went on a, you know, a path to trying to understand as to the best of my knowledge, you know, the literature and what the literature out there says on, on how viruses evolve and um, what the selective pressure is and what you know, what that typically, you know, entails. And so from all of my reading and understanding, again, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Um, to me, I came out of it with the understanding that viruses, the selective pressure on viruses is to evolve to become more transmissible. They are not under a selection pressure to become more virulent. In other words, it's not in their best interest to kill their host because if they kill their host then they can't their host can't incubate the virus and allow them to reproduce and infect more people. And so all the studies that I've read outline that there's these these factors and that virulence isn't something that's selected for. It is something that happens incidentally to transmission. In a, in other words, it sort of hitchhikes alongside. So a virus evolves to become more transmissible. Like that is its its major purpose. And in some cases, if it becomes more transmissible, sometimes it can also become more virulent. It can be more, you know, dangerous to, to its host. And um, so, in other, so many of the different studies have outlined that there are factors that limit transmission. So if something limits the transmission, then it's also going to limit the the potential of the virus to become more virulent. And the factors that limit transmission are, one, physical constraints. So the virus infects human cells, and the human cells then make the viral proteins and, you know, are basically allowing the, the virus to replicate. So our own cellular machinery, uh, the ability of our cells to assemble viral proteins the ability of our cells metabolically to do it quick enough. Like there's a limit to that. Like we can only do that so quickly. So once that happens, then, you know, a virus is sort of reached its peak transmissibility in a, in a way uh, because our cells physically can't do it quicker than it's already doing it, if that makes sense. And so um, with the Delta variant right now, we may be at a peak transmissibility. Trans you know, we may be at the point where our cells can't, assemble all the viral proteins quick enough for it to become even more transmissible. We don't know. Maybe maybe we're not there yet, but maybe we are. We have we have no idea. It's definitely a, a much more transmissible variant. Um, so that's the one thing that that limits the the ability of a virus to become more virulent is the, the limitation of, of, on transmission. The other thing is more host mortality. And so, you know, if if a virus, you know, is is killing uh, the host, within a certain time frame, but, you know, before transmission ends, then, you know, you, you start to like not be able to transmit the virus more and you're not going to have more variants crop up because the host is dying. And so um, this is something people have been very concerned about with vaccines because the argument is that vaccines are preventing 
more, you know, they're preventing hospitalizations, they're preventing people from dying from COVID-19, and therefore they're going to allow the virus to have a chance to mutate in, into something that is more virulent. Again, it has to, it has to mutate into something that's more transmissible, vir virulent, hitchhiked, hitchhiked alongside of that. Um, but if you look at the, the deaths uh, in COVID-19, people that are unvaccinated or just generally speaking, people usually die much later than the transmission phase. They, they die, you know, days and days and days after actually becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2. And so um, the transmission phase is well over before people are even dying. So the reality is, is that people that are unvaccinated have, you know, they're, they're, they're creating these mutations and allowing variants to evolve even at a greater rate, because not only are they, you know, able to do it even before they it potentially succumb to death, but, you know, the fact that we just talked about overall transmission reduced by vaccines. So um, people with that are vaccinated are less likely to even get infected. And we talked about onward transmission reduced. In other words, people are clearing the virus faster that are vaccinated than unvaccinated. In every sense, people that are unvaccinated, there's more chances for the virus to replicate and to potentially mutate and form another variant that be, that could become more transmissible and thus potentially more virulent. Now, people are also conflating the vaccine escaped immunity. That is a completely different thing. That is not something that is relevant to um, to virulence. If you look into the, if you look at the the, the large body of, of scientific literature, literature covering this topic, I shouldn't say large body. It's actually quite limited. But um, you know, so so there is no example of human vaccines causing a more virulent strain. There are examples of vaccine in escape. So in other words, variants crop up that are no longer, that can evade the antibodies produced by, by vaccines. And that's, that's a different thing. That isn't something that's more virulent. That's something that's going to affect people that are vaccinated because now they're going to be more likely to be infected and their vaccine is less effective. Um, that's a very different thing than, than what we're talking about, which is the evolution, the selective pressure on viruses to transmit, become more transmissible. And that is the selective pressure that exists, not virulence. Virulence hitchhikes alongside the transmiss transmission aspect of um, why viruses, you know, mutate, basically, and the selective pressure that's on them to do that. Dr. Schwal, I want to hear your thoughts on that. And, and also, um, Dr. Patrick mentioned how, you know, with Delta variant and other variants, um, and in the past with vaccines, how sometimes a variant can crop up that escapes vaccine antibodies. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the other big aspect of the immune system, and that's the T cell response and how um, that can still offer us a lot of protection potentially? Sure, yeah. So first of all, in order for you to have variants, you have to have replication because it's the errors in replication that cause variants. And so the only way you can have replication is if you have viruses in hosts. So if you look at the examples that we have, whether it's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, most of these variants, if not all of them, came from populations that were not vaccinated. Now, India has done a great job at producing vaccines, and they're well on their way to vaccinating their population, fortunately. But the Delta variant came out early on when they were not having a lot of people vaccinated. Uh, same thing with the South African variant and the, and the, the P1 that came out of, of Brazil. This was during a time where there was not vaccinated. If it was vaccination that caused variants, then we should be seeing variants coming out of Israel and the United States. Now, in terms of B cell, or I should say antibodies, antibodies are very important when it comes to neutralizing a virus that is outside of your cells predominantly. So neutralizing it before they infect the cells. Uh, so that, that's very, very important. But there's a whole other aspect to the immunity that help in terms of hospitalization, in terms of there's memory T cells, and that is what we just mentioned was the T cells, the cytotoxic T cells and, and the rest of it. What's interesting that I found about uh, T cells is that when they reproduce, they also reproduce in a way where they put errors in there so that as, as the virus may mutate, there seems to be some evidence that the T cell response may be able to anticipate and mutate along with it. Now that's not 100% science yet, but uh, there seems to be some evidence of that, at least in the research articles that I've read. 
And if you look at what's happening right now with the Delta variant in, in Israel and the United States, we see a reduction in the ability of the vaccines to reduce uh, transmission, right? So with the Delta variant, we, instead of the 90, 80 to 90 percent that we enjoyed early on in the pandemic, it's been knocked down somewhat. But we really haven't seen an erosion to that extent in prevention of hospitalization and severe disease. And that that has more to do with T cell responses and cytotoxic, because by this point, the virus is inside the body already inside the cells and antibodies have very limited ability to take care of those types of situations. So um, the immune system is very complex. Um, and I think um, we need to uh, just sort of look back and, and always couple our our in vitro hypotheses with, with real world data. And so far the real world data is still holding up in terms of prevention of severe disease. And I'd also like to add, there, there's been some sort of a, uh, a false equivalence, if you will, that is made in terms of what we know that overuse of antibiotics can cause bacterial resistance to those antibiotics. And there's no question about that. That's a whole other topic of discussion, the overuse of antibiotics in, in humans and in animals especially. And that gives rise to these superbugs that emerge that are no longer susceptible to the antibiotics that we have. But that's a different situation. That's where the antibiotics that are being used are, are basically selectively killing out all of the susceptible bacteria and only leaving those that are resistant. So in other words, the resistant bacteria already exist, but we're knocking out the bacteria that are susceptible and allowing the resistant forms to, to produce. That's very different than what we're talking about with vaccines, because in the terms of vaccines and viruses, the resistant viruses don't exist. What allows them to be created is the ability to replicate. OK, and that's very different with bacteria. In bacteria, um, very few resistant bacteria are occurring because they're being allowed to replicate. The only way that they can become resistant is if they acquire DNA that gives them, uh, they're called plasmids or vectors, that allow antibiotic resistance to then be incorporated in their DNA. That's not the case with viruses. Viruses and bacteria are very different.